Today, 28 February 2015 is considered rare genetic disorder day. This also is a day when India celebrates science. To participate in this webinar on this day and to give my thought and to tell you how today, 20 years later, a dream which was born in mid 90s. and take you back to 1985 which is the genesis of my exposure to Human Genome Project. After spending a very fast PhD in peptides and proteins models at Molecular Biophysics Unit and Indian of Science, I was able to publish several papers including papers in PNAs, Jack's American Chemical Society and several other papers in macromolecules, biomolecules. So no wonder, after a very brief stint in France, after submitting my thesis in a very short period, I could come back to Indian Institute of Science to join as a research associate and as a faculty in 1980. A brief journey into structural biology, including extensive exposure to nucleic acid structure, fascinated me to get into the realms of genome. I was very fortunate that in 1975 I met Alexander Rich. He has just then solved the structure of tRNA, who also had early career in working in the triple helical structure of collagen, on which he did my PhD looking at post translational modification. He told me when I asked him what is the single advice you will give to the young people to build a career in science, and he told me remain in the frontier of science. I am so happy that advice of 1975, 40 years down the road, I tried to follow and stayed in the frontier of science. By 1980, chromatin analysis in 1978-79 was just beginning. I could quickly show that how minor group of polypeptide, poly, sorry, minor group of polynucleotide interacts with the histone using laser Raman spectroscopy, which I could publish. And then I joined Molecular Biophysics Unit, the first MBU student to become a faculty as a lecturer. Even before I became lecturer as a research associate, I asked myself what would be the topics on which I would have an unfair advantage over the world. You realize India was a poor country and we have very little resources. So 1980 there was a paper by Francis Crick and Orville where he said the repetitive DNA are junk and it will have very little functional significance and any work on that which will be intellectually futile. I realized that the American funding will not be supported for work in repetitive DNA. And that's the first time when the DNA polymorphism was in the air. Extensive work on polypeptide, polynucleotide polymorphism and trying to understand whether such unusual DNA structures can take place inside the cell. It brought me into recombinant technology and molecular biology. I had brilliant students 
who could help in synthesizing those oligos, cloning them, figuring it out how those structures like cDNA, hairpin, triplex can form inside the bacterial cell when the bacteria is cloned and transformed and to measure the gene expressions and to see even genomic instability in triplet repeat clones. It was this time that I spent a summer of three months in Colombia in the Charles Cantus Laboratory as a visiting scientist in 1985. And it happened to be that month Charles Odessi in Washington was figuring out to start a big project. And that first meeting took place which was the birth or I'll say fertilization of an idea which eventually made into a great project called Human Genome Project. I was very privileged to the great discussions that followed every other evening with Charles Cantor and some of the colleagues. Every meeting of Washington back to New York, I had the privilege of knowing genomics, how people were thinking of the future, how one builds a big project like Human Genome Sequence, I, Human Genome Project, three billion dollars, the ambition of solving such gigantic 3.2 billion dollar, 3.2 billion nucleotide of sequences. When capability was so limited, even thousand nucleotide sequencing would have taken days together. And at this rate, it would have taken 200 years to complete the genome sequence. But these scientists were dedicated, visionary, and I had this great excitement that this will be done in 15 years. My back home, large number of seminars and opportunities and workshops were conducted as back as 1987 on genome analysis and pulse I still remember my visit to Andrew Mitzabikov's laboratory, Edward Southern's laboratory. People were dreaming how to get DNA chips to sequence DNA. All I can tell, eventually in 1990, Hugo took initiative and Human Genome Project to Earth. I was very lucky to be part of the Hugo membership at the early stage. Why I give you this background to tell how under those circumstances there were very limited resources that India had. Therefore, we still continue to focus our science at Bangalore on repetitive DNA. And I'm very glad that some of those work on telomeric repeat, trinucleotide repeat, GCD repeat, RTG repeats, and eventually all those nice publications that were cited. I wanted to tell you in this seminar that how come a person who is trained in molecular biophysics, structural biology, worried about DNA transactions, worried about gene expression, suddenly one day started worrying about genetic disorders. You know, it was an interesting accident. As I said, 1985 was an accident for my exposure to genomics. 1993, the discovery of myotonic dystrophy and to see the triplet repeat sequences are actually causing a disease process with the expansion outside the coding region fascinated me and showed that all that we are believing that repeats has no function is no longer true. It was a great feeling. Then came telomere structures. We validated some of our hypotheses and our own structural work. 
So being motivated, I asked myself that how come fit, little fetal gene expression can make patients to have less blood transfusion who are thalassemia patients. With that objective, I went to Calcutta and I really first time saw patients. Although I went as a scientist to pick up samples, to, to come up with some hypotheses, how is the beta globin gene sequencing and to see whether which mutations actually can activate fetal gene. Very pure objective of writing one more paper like any other scientist. And we got the genome sequencing machine. I realized that a simple PCR, appropriate diagnostics, few sequencing could have saved so many people who would have born as thalassemic out of parents who are carrier. That evening at Calcutta Ramakrishna Mission Hospital, a transformation took place. When I became fellow of the National Academy, you have to oath and say, for the uphold of the scientific fraternity and uphold of the mankind, you take the academic oath. To me, mankind so far was my science, my paper, my students, my recognition, promotion, grant, next grant, next award. So why I think this, that I'm sure many young students will listen to this talk. They all are in the mid beginning of their career, middle of their career. I only can say that it prompted, realize, I realized that you have to spend tens of 20,000 rupees even to send a sample to get it analyzed in United Kingdom labs like Weatherall's lab or other labs. And they were publishing papers of Indian mutations in subcontinent. How can we not make some PCR primers and PCR machines are there at IIC? So that forced me to think 20% of my newly acquired toy of genome sequencing time to thalassemia. And that's was the beginning of my exposure to genetic diseases. So I, you can see in one side I was interested in repetitive sequences, another side to understand gene expression that drove me to thalassemia. And once thalassemia, I realized that Indian genetic pool and with the genome sequence available, by the time genome sequencing was hot, but India was poor, could not participate in sequencing, that future genetic disorders, there will be technology which will allow us to decipher those markers, those mutations, and those technology will happen, it will arrive in India and maybe it will not be available to Indian community because we haven't created enough scientific capability. With this vision, the idea was born to establish an institute of genomics and that brought me all the way to Delhi. Why I said this? That Today, on this rare genetic disorder day, India has enough capability of doing sequencing and we have also launched a book today on how exome sequencing could be used for clinical purposes. And when you put them together, a small journey of 15 years, you can see it has happened. It did not happen by sheer accident. It needed lots of planning. But all about this, it needed some sort of desire to stay in the frontier of science. I recall all our work on ZDNA when actually we manually looked at and curated. 3 million nucleotide sequence of human and 2 odd million nucleotide sequence of mouse and we couldn't find a long track of CTCG6. 
I knew that the ZDNA rich sequences will be absent in the human genome. However, TG repeat sequences will be there, which are flexible under conditions of methylation and all they can undergo changes. So therefore, entire genome sequence when available will be a great opportunity to the genome informatics and in the population to build a molecular genetics platform which eventually whose outcome will be application to patient care. Why it is necessary to look at rare genetic disorders? When we started, this, we started with ataxia. Reason was it has involved in triplet repeat expansion and repeat was our interest. And measuring expanded repeats did not need us to do too much sequencing, but however, we did lots of expensive sequencing. So today we know the frequency of these ataxias are not so large, small percentage, but it has given us a great insight in understanding the genomic stability and how instability causes problems, how does the replication take place, and how these diseases are inherited, and why there is age-related connectivity and progressive disorder. We have understood sickle cell anemia, the great work of Max Perut and Kendrew to understand hemoglobin and myoglobin structure has helped us to understand in molecular terms why sickling of cell happens and how sickle cell anemia causes. It also gave us a perspective how at the population level, heterozygous individuals are protected from malarial parasite infection and thereby heterozygous are protected from malaria. It's very funny that a homozygous state, you die because of a different disease and heterozygous states, you are protected when all people others who are homozygous wild type are affected by malaria. What a fantastic interplay of evolution and genetics. But my belief, the biology to be understood, it has to be understood at the structural terms. So beautifully understood in hemoglobinopathies. But unfortunately we don't have 500,000 or 200,000 scientists who will dedicate their life like Max Perut and Kendrew to do protein by protein, disease by disease is complex. So Human Genome Project was an outcome of looking for Dorsian muscular dystrophy gene, looking for cystic fibrosis gene, which took decades. But once for all, a sequencing allows you to get all these genes in one shot. I can tell you, although I knew the genome sequencing will happen, but I never believed that it could happen really at such a low cost. Even in 2004 or 5, I remember 100 years ago, you know, the Nature Genetics came up with a big suggestion that what will be done if genome sequence can be done in $1,000. Many people said many things, including myself, 50 scientists gave their views, but I really doubt whether in India it will be possible to do, whether we will be able to do an exome sequencing in, I think, 10,000 rupees. So therefore, progressing science is disruptive. But one thing is very important, that you have to be crazy enough to believe that things can happen. Normally, it is seen, as in the words of Steve Jobs, those crazy enough to believe that they can do and change the world are usually the ones they do change the world. So therefore, a 30 years beautiful journey from a dream to reality it's an amazing experience. Very rarely it gets in your lifetime such opportunity.
I'm sure all of us have read atomic theory, we have read about the atom bomb projects, but it hasn't happened before we were born. Many science happens, and very rarely we get a chance of a science, birth of the science, to the finish and benefit of the science, seen in three decades' time. And it just happened to be a prime time of one's life and career. As you know, you have to be innovator. You have to be brave enough to think differently and bold enough to believe that you can change and talented enough to do so. All I can say, you have to be brave enough to think differently. You have to believe in yourself, but you also have to have talent to make it so. And I can tell you, the today in this monogenic disorder or I would say the real disease day, it needs a tre tremendous collaboration between the clinicians, the people and the genomic scientists. I have no doubt that IGIB, CSIR, IGIB has matured the scientists and they matured into very strong professional, both we know Shridhar, Dibash, Shmitari, there's so many of them and they should be able to provide one side the holistic view, another side a delivery. In this talk, I look at if I have to think what will happen when I'm 90 years old, what we can expect to happen. I believe we will have much cheaper way. I believe you know all costs will get down to a cell phone cost and maybe five thousand rupees. I don't know what will be the value of rupees that time, but I only say the cost of a cell phone. One will be able to get the genomic data done. Maybe then analysis will be like the number of calls you make. So the data will sit somewhere. And whatever analysis you want is like calling a car and you pay for it, subscription. And it will be cheap, it's not very expensive. It will be like any other diagnostics, the way you get blood sugar tested, or you know, thyroid test, or something like that. But will we be able to create actionable genomics? I'm confident with this book, if it is practiced by doctors, the book that has been written on exon genome sequencing by Reno and Sridhar, if doctors really practice it, then we'll have an ethical genomics in position in this country. I'm sure this book will undergo change. All that is written will be obsolete by five years' time. Very new knowledge will come in. But what is important that the medical practice has to have larger ethical standard when you start analyzing genome. Not to convert it into horoscope reading and predicting. It should be very, very scientific and thorough. The number two, your genome may not change, but the readability and interpretation of the genome will undergo change. And that will depend on disease to disease complexity of the disease. When it comes to these rare genetic diseases, we need extreme cooperation between patients. So as it will become a participatory science to get it personalized, to get it precision, and to make sure that clinical practices are able to decide. Does this mean we will be only remaining in understanding the disease and providing genetic counseling so that we don't have the next generation born with a specific sex type depending on X-link, non-X-link or we will actually be able to do therapeutic intervention and we are seeing that in the cancer area therapeutic intervention has started. I'm sure there are other areas therapeutic intervention start. How do we visualize this rare genetic disorder, therapeutic intervention which will not be very cost effective because in So one of the 
outcome of the rare genetic disorder that one will come up with certain pathways, understanding where the errors and the mutations and come up with some targeted drugs which will go through a rapid clinical trial because it is very rare and a small number of community will demand their treatment. However, it is only those treatment, let's say for example, rapid uh, red nitrous pigmentosis or eye disorder, where it is very fast it happens, it has no therapeutic possibilities so what they will be subjected to. Patients will can go through some trials and come up with something and then that will give us an understanding how to treat diseases which are not so fast progressing. That means rare genetic disorder will help us to understand the diseases of the organ and thereby design new therapeutic intervention for the diseases of the same organ based on the pathway analysis. And that's what I see the future. So what is happening? We will have a complete system level pathway understanding, build complete system level understanding and then from these various genetic, rare genetic disorders to be connected and all this then one will be able to analyze and part up in computer and once you do it in computer then you figure it out what would be the most important targets and there will be small molecules which then with high precision one should be able to do. There will be also an area where great expansion will take place is what I call antibody. There are lots of new antibodies will be developed which protein specific because proteomics data will be available and you should be able to therapeutic intervention using immunotherapy will take place. The next area where we still don't know how it will happen, many many diseases some metabolites are actually triggers or might trigger the disease process. It will be discovered. One will then have engineered food to make sure those metabolites are degraded prior, maybe through microbiome change, through the engineered bacteria, edible bacteria. And those edible bacteria then could provide also the deficient supplement, whether you have a phenyl deficiency, phenyl deficiency or some deficiency. Now you will have a yogurt which will provide the supplement. So I see the genetic diseases. Next three decades will be treated the way we are treated for all known genetic diseases, infectious diseases and there should be new vista. And I think this symposium opens up a possibility of bringing people into the cyberspace and crowdsource the patients, crowdsource the annotation to the students, become a new media by which the students learn science differently, practice research differently and it will eliminate the monopoly of science in elite institution the science will become citizen science. And with this participatory model in cyberspace, this conference is a great beginning for understanding inherited disorders.